What comes to mind when you start a new game and watch that classic Final Fantasy VII opening? Off the top of my head, I recall looking up to a night sky full of stars. I pictured a close-up of Aerith as the green Mako particles float around her face. I remember her standing up before making her way through an alley, as we zoom out through the hustle and bustle of Midgar before finally reaching Shinra Tower. So, how do we go about recreating this intro while adding something new to the mix and also keeping it faithful to the original theme and design? Let's start with a simple storyboard. I generally use a storyboard to help me sketch out ideas quickly. While there are more professional ways to do this, um, I prefer to just keep it simple and draw out whatever comes to mind while adding a few notes here and there. If you'd like to sketch along with me, there is a storyboard template PNG included in the zip file from the description below. Now you can go ahead and import that into whichever drawing software you use, whether it is like uh, anything like Clip Studio Pro or Photoshop or whichever one you feel is most comfortable. You can go ahead and import that and still should be able to use the techniques that I will be doing with this storyboard. I mean, it's very simple. Um, also, if you are a Patreon supporter, you can go ahead and open up the storyboard template Photoshop file located in the templates folder. And that will allow you to follow exactly um, the steps are, that I'm gonna be showing you guys today. So let's go ahead and start off with that opening shot. So we have, let's see what we got here. The scene starts off in space and the camera pans through the stars. The camera then moves down and the stars fade away as Aerith fades in with a um, subtle zoom out shot that happens right after that. Applying this to the storyboard, I decided to use that same shot of the stars now. Now I want you to take a look at this uh, yellow box here. This will be our camera. Everything within this box is what the camera sees and everything out of the box is what's going to be out of frame. So the uh, yellow arrows here indicate which way I might want the camera to move. Uh, moving on from that, I uh, wanted to add a different transition leading into Aerith than the original intro or than what the original intro had. So I decided to use a meteor similar to that meteor from the uh, Final Fantasy VII logo and have that start way off in the distance and have that meteor then quickly zoom into frame before it loses momentum and then suddenly turning into materia. So then the materia will, the material falls out of frame into a bed of uh, Mako particles and those will be the lights that float up around Aerith's uh, face at the end before she finally appears. Always remember that your storyboards shouldn't be the end all be all of your final animation. Um, as a matter of fact, more times than not, you'll be adding on more things to your shots until you have something that resembles that image in your head. This storyboard is just a quick way to get those ideas out of your head and onto paper. Now, before we begin animating this, uh, we have to make sure that our storyboard makes sense <laughs> and just flows smoothly. Now, in order to achieve this, I like to use animatics to help start a blueprint on which to build that final animation on. My animatics are pretty much just an expansion of the storyboard. For creating the animatic, I'll be using, once again, Photoshop CC. The same can be done for any animation software or any software with a timeline. Uh, supporters, this is where you can go ahead and open up the animatic template PSD. For everyone else, we're going to go ahead and open up a new Photoshop document and set the resolution to something decent to sketch on. Uh, so change the width to 1280 pixels and height by 720 pixels and have the resolution at 300. Change the background color to whatever you like. I personally like to keep it on this grayish color since it's easier on the eyes for me to look at on hours on end than the default white. And once that's done, go ahead and hit create. 
Next thing we're going to do is enable the timeline by clicking on the window tab at the top left and select timeline towards the bottom of the menu. Doing so will make this window appear here. On the timeline itself, let's change the uh, format to a video style. Now, while we're on the timeline, let's click on this menu to the right, select set timeline frame rate, <laughs> and change the frame rate to 24 FPS, because uh, 24 uh, frames per second is the average frame rate when it comes to animation, um, 2D animation that is. Next thing we're going to do is take this layer zero and rename it to background and make sure to lock it just to ensure that the uh, frames we create won't overlap one another. Uh, let's go ahead and create a new layer and let's leave it alone for now. We'll, we'll give it a name later. So, but anyway, let's go back to the timeline, drag this slider right here at the bottom left and slide it to the right. Now, as you can see, it zooms in the frames on our timeline and it will help us keep track uh, when moving to forward and previous frames. So now what we're going to do is chop up this layer into individual frames. Uh, to do so, we are going to utilize a few keyboard shortcuts. And those are going to be next frame, previous frame, and split at playhead. And while we're at it, we're also going to use another useful shortcut that is called Enable Onion Skin. Now, unfortunately, these shortcuts do not have any default keys or default shortcuts that you can use on your keyboard. So what we're going to do is uh, set up these shortcuts really quick. In order to access your keyboard shortcuts in Photoshop, press uh, Alt, Control, Shift, and K at the same time on your keyboard. Alternatively, you can just go up here to the Edit tab at the top left and click on Keyboard Shortcuts near the bottom of the list. Um, now, once we're in the menu, click on this Shortcuts 4 menu and in the drop down, select Panel Menus right here. Once you've done that, scroll down here and expand the uh, Timeline Video. Now, let's go ahead and select Next Frame and type in a shortcut that you'd like to use uh, to move towards the next frame of animation. I personally use control and period at the same time. However, I know everyone will have their own preference. Um, you know, just different strokes, different folks. All right, now let's go ahead and make a shortcut for previous frame. And scroll down a little bit more down the list and we'll make a shortcut for split at playhead. All right, and let's scroll down all the way and let's make a shortcut for Enable Onion Skins. Alright, hit Accept, and then OK. And now let's get back to our timeline. Now what you want to do is, um, on Layer 1, make sure that the playhead is at the very beginning. And now, with whatever you pick for your shortcut to go uh, next frame, push that shortcut key. Otherwise, you can also click on this button right here to move forward by one frame. All right, and then you want to use the shortcut that you have for split at playhead. You can also click on the scissor icon right here to split. Now this layer has been split into two. And what you want to do now is take the top layer that uh, was just created and drag it back down into the uh, first layer here. And there you go. You now have two frames. Uh, in Photoshop, these are called video groups or the way that we have it set up with the uh, video styles, they're gonna be labeled as video groups. And if you look here, you should see this icon next to your video group layer. So let's name this group Meteor Sketch. So now if we go back to the first frame, draw a sketch and go forward to the second frame and draw a sketch, uh, you can see how we're going to start to build our animatic and how we're going to start animating in general. And whenever you do draw on a frame, always make sure that the frame you are on is highlighted and that the playhead is actually touching that frame. Otherwise, you would get this crossed out cursor. And when you do try to draw something, you will get this uh, error message and really you won't be able to do anything. So as we're going along creating new frames on our timeline, Let's also rename our frames in a numerical order. We'll change layer one copy to two, 
and so on as we progress. Having a video group with more than one frame allows you to enable the onion skin and change its settings within this drop down menu. I uh, usually keep my frames before and after at one and change it to two or more depending on whatever it is I happen to be animating. Max opacity at 50, you should keep it at around 50, and minimum at 25. I also generally keep my blending mode um, at multiply, but sometimes I would change it to normal or even screen if I uh, have lighter colors on a dark background. But uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's go back to our video group and continue splitting this frame. Like before, using those shortcuts that we just made, I'm gonna go ahead and hit next frame, split at playhead, next frame, split, and I'm just keep on doing that. Um, I think about if we have 12 ind individual frames to start off with, uh, but I'm definitely going to add more and probably be adding more <laughs> even after that as I go along. So go, you can also, um, once you're finished, go ahead and delete any of the extra frames at the end. If we need more, if we need to add more frames, we can either do that by dragging out an existing frame and splitting it, or we can just add a new layer within this video group and split it however you see fit. Uh, either way, let's start sketching out this meteor, finally. Here I am just going over what was in the storyboard and trying to flesh it out a little. I'll have that meteor start off in the distance like I uh, talked about before. And moving on to the next frame and so on, it gets closer and closer to the camera. It's okay to be messy here. I just need to get these frames down on the timeline to get a better idea of how the movement will be. So I'm also uh, making sure to use my onion skins to accurately place the meteor. Uh, sometimes I will have repeat frames and I'll just, you know, copy and paste to, to make a quick loop. And also make sure to resize the frame's length at the uh, bottom on the timeline to make your timing as accurate as you need it to be. So sometimes you might want to shorten the frame or sometimes you might want to increase it by just a little bit and always it always helps me out a lot and there we go i think i think this looks fine side notes about the frame rates if your animation is starting to lag look down here to the uh, bottom as your animation plays uh, if it is in the red that means that it's not playing at its full speed uh, so this can be fixed by letting the animation play through in its entirety and letting it render and then playing it again or zoom out on your mouse to scroll out and when you hit the playback uh, it should be a little bit faster but whatever you do just make sure that these numbers down here are not red I'll make sure they're actually in in green because once they're in green it means they're playing at full speed so just something to keep in mind to, uh, to have your animation loop over and over again, just make sure that these work area sliders cover all of the frames that you want to uh, want to see looped. This sketchy animation gives me an idea of how I want the final version to be. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this animatic as a PSD first, and then save it as a video just to use as a reference. To do this, go to File, Export, and Render Video. Once that's exported, we can go ahead and begin animating the final version of this. We are going to set up a new Photoshop document suited for the actual animation process. Um, if you are a Patreon supporter, I already have this template ready for you called the 1920 by 1080 camera template. For everyone else, here's how to make it. Start a new document, set the width to 1920 pixels and the height to 1080 pixels, uh, resolution at 300. Color mode should be RGB and 8-bit. The background color can be whatever you want, though I prefer this light, lightish gray. Uh, hit create once you've decided. Unlock this background layer and name it 1920 by 1080 camera. And then 
make a new layer, name it background, and drag it under the 1920 layer. Next, you want to go up to the image tab on the top left and click on change canvas size. Set the units to pixel and change the width to 2560 and the height to 1440. It doesn't have to be exactly this 1440p size. Um, sometimes it can even go up to a 4K resolution, which would be 3840 by 2160, um, but depending on the shot, it can be smaller or even larger. Just make sure it's bigger than 1920 by 1080. Go ahead and hit OK once you're done. Now select the background layer and grab the fill tool. Select the color to contrast the uh, 1920 by 1080 square in the middle. Uh, for me, I'll be using this tannish color here. Go ahead and fill that in and there you have it. Everything in the middle rectangle will be what the camera or we, the viewer, will see in the final animation. And everything that's outside the middle rectangle will be what's off frame. This is very helpful for shots when objects, backgrounds, or even characters uh, come in and out of frame often. It also helps for whenever you have a shot that pans the camera. To organize this a little bit better, let's click on this button here on the bottom right to make a new folder group. And let's name it camera and drag both of our layers into there. And we can go ahead and lock this folder as well. Next, we're going to set up our timeline like we did before. Make a new layer, chop it down, and move the layers into the first sketch, uh, creating a video group. Now, let's name that video group Sketch. A new thing that we're going to do is assign our layers and video group with a color. This will come in handy as we create more groups and layers for organizational purposes. To assign a color, all you have to do is just right click on the eye next to the layer or group and choose a color. Uh, let's pick red for this one. Now the group is highlighted in red for both the layer and video timeline. Anyway, let's continue sketching. Looking back at our animatic as a guide, I'm adding more frames to what was originally drawn. I'm also adding more movement to this meteor by having it curve here before it turns into materia. Another thing that I'm doing is uh, getting the timing to reflect momentum by increasing and decreasing the length of certain frames. All right, so this process is pretty lengthy, so I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward. All right, so I went ahead and backtracked a little bit um, and changed the shape of the first few frames. Because this is a simple animation, a lot of these frames will be looping over, uh, like these three, for example. So for these, I went ahead and copy pasted uh, these frames to loop before the meteor turns and then copy pasted again when it hits another angle and again when it hits this angle. Once the rough animation is done, the next step would usually be to add some line art, uh, maybe some line art for the shadows and highlights and so forth. But however, I kind of like the sketchy feel of the uh, aura trail that we see. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right into adding some solid lines. We're going to add a new layer and grab the ellipse tool. Make sure that the fill is crossed out and the stroke can be set to any color for now and set this to two pixels. Now I'm going to go ahead and drag out a circle and now press Ctrl and T on your keyboard to transform the circle. We'll resize it to fit just inside the meteor sketch. Now we're going to chop this up into a video group. Note the length of the frames here. I'm chopping them to exactly match the length of the sketch video group right below. Okay, now let's name this video group Meteor Circle before going further. Now back on the timeline, when I go to the next frame, I'm using the Control T shortcut and moving the circle frame to fit directly inside the Meteor sketch. Now this is also going to take some time, so let me go ahead and fast forward again. 
All right, take a look. Now that the circle placement is done for all of the frames, I'm going to change the layer color to green and move the meteor circle group under the sketch video group. The reason for that is so that the aura lines could be seen over the circle. Next thing I'm going to do is add another layer to the background color. This way, I can turn the layer off and on to see how the colors will match with darkness. Now, let's color in the surrounding aura over the meteor. Add a new layer and place it under the sketch layer. Chop up the layer on your timeline and create a video group. And let's name it color. Now we're going to take a base color and in each frame, just color within the sketch lines or do the best you can to color within the sketch lines. Make sure you're on the color video group as you're doing this. Actually, let's put the color video group under all of the others so we can see the meteor circle. The unfortunate part about coloring over a sketch is that you won't always be able to quickly use the fill tool. So I try not to ding myself too hard if I go outside the lines a little bit. It's okay here since I want that sketchy fill to it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and skip forward. All right, now that the color is filled in for all of the frames, let's duplicate all of the video groups we have so far and put it in its own folder named duplicates. Now, this is only for safekeeping, just in case we have to come back and change something later. And we can go ahead and put a lock on this folder since we won't be needing it anytime soon. Okay, so now we're going to add in a gradient that actually matches the uh, Final Fantasy VII Meteor logo. So let's add a gradient to the Meteor. To do this, let's start a frame where we can see the full Meteor in our color video group. There's no need to make a new video group for this since we'll be using layer styles. Double click on the layer to bring up the layer style menu. Now on the left side of the window, click on the gradient overlay. Make sure it's highlighted and make sure it's also checkmarked. Our blending mode is going to stay as normal, opacity 100, and our style is going to be linear. Now, double click into the gradient rectangle here. This will bring up the gradient editor. Let's also bring up the FF7 logo so we can get some more accurate colors into this. You see this rectangle down here with the uh, square sliders? This is our gradient map. The top sliders we are going to leave alone for now and just focus on the bottom ones. These square sliders represent how many colors are in our gradient map. If you click right below the rectangle, it'll add a slider. You can also remove a slider by clicking on one and hitting the delete key on your keyboard. Let's get about five bottom sliders here. And let's bring up our reference image. See how the tip of the meteor is white, but how the gradient towards the tail of the meteor gets a little bit darker with this emerald color. We're going to do the same thing by sampling these colors. Now, our meteor is facing left, so on our gradient map, the rightmost slider will be our lightest color, and the leftmost will be the darkest. Before we move forward, I'm going to shrink Photoshop so I can put peer ref right next to it. Then, let's go back into our layer styles by clicking the gradient overlay right here in the layer that we picked to change, and go back to the color picker. Now, while we can try to pinpoint these colors manually, we can also pick colors from our reference and outside sources. All you have to do is hover your mouse out of the color picker and onto the canvas back here. See how our mouse cursor turned into this dropper? Now, hold down the left click on your mouse and move it onto the reference image. Let's get the lightest color at the tip. Once your mouse is over the color that you want, you can go ahead and let go of the left click. And there you go. We got the color straight from the reference. Hit OK. And let's do this again with the leftmost slider. This time, we're going to go for the darkest color. Once that's done, we're going to pretty much do the same thing with the 
other sliders. Uh, let's go ahead and pick colors one by one down this meteor. Might actually need to add a slider or two, depending on your own personal preference. Now, once all the colors are picked, make sure to spread out the sliders accordingly to have the colors blend nicely. If you click once on a slider, it'll bring up these dots. You can also move these to have greater control on smoothness of the color range. Cool, everything looks good. Now let's hit OK on the gradient editor and hit OK on the layer style window and take a look at the layer we just changed. Notice how we now have effects and gradient overlay enabled. These are layer styles and we're going to apply them to all of the frames in this video group. But not yet. You see, there is a problem. The rotation of this gradient only really works for this angle. For example, I'm going to go ahead and apply this gradient to all the frames. Now, as I scroll through all of these, you see how the colors don't really match the animation? Uh, the best way to fix this is to use a different gradient rotation each time the meteor turns. Luckily, this isn't really too hard to do. Let me go ahead and undo what I just did here. So the gradients that we just made only work for about the first frame to about the frame right here. To apply the gradient to only these frames, let's first click the layer with the effects and gradient overlay styles and select copy layer style. Next, we're going to make sure that this layer is highlighted and scroll down to the first frame. Hold down the shift key on your keyboard and while holding shift, left click that layer. As you can see, only these layers are selected. Next, go ahead and right click that layer and click on paste layer styles. Okay, now the gradient is applied to only these selected layers. Now let's go to the first frame when the meteor changes direction. Uh, about this one right here. Let's right click and paste our style onto here. Let's double click this layer and in the layer style menu, go back to our gradient overlay. Alternatively, you can also just double click here where it says gradient overlay to bring you to the same menu. So here we need to change our gradient angle. This can be done by just simply adjusting the angle dial right here. Let's move it down here to match the meteor animation. All right, that looks good. Let's hit OK. And like before, let's apply this layer style to all of the frames with this particular angle. All right, let's go ahead and copy this layer style and select the frames to match. So from here to around here, right click and paste layer styles. So now I'm just going to repeat the process for all of the angles for this meteor. Now that the gradient is applied to all of the layers, for organizational purposes, let's go ahead and consolidate this. Make sure all of the layers in this group are highlighted, and once again, right-click on one of the layers. This time, hit Rasterize Layer Style. And let me go ahead and assign numbers to all of these frames. All right, looks a lot better, doesn't it? We now have merged the gradient into the colors that we created earlier. So let's take a look at our reference image one more time and see how the outline of the meteor is white. Let's apply that to the animation as well. We are going to go over our sketch video group and let's pick a frame where we can see the full meteor up close. Uh, yeah, yep, this should work. Make sure that the playhead is always over the frame that you wish to edit. Okay, and just like how we did with the gradient, we are going to go back into the layer styles and this time pick color overlay. Once we've selected our color, hit OK. Now, let's go ahead and copy paste this layer style onto all of our frames. 
And like we did before, don't forget to rasterize the layer styles to keep things tidy. I also want to show you guys an easier way of doing this, um, adding layer styles without having to apply the layer styles to each and every single frame individually. Uh, for this technique, we'll be using a mask. So to do this, go ahead and add a layer and put it over our Meteor Circle video group. Um, in order to apply a mask, press and hold the Alt key on your keyboard. Now, what you want to do is take your mouse cursor and move it right in between the mask layer and the layer you want to put a mask over. So in this case, it'll be between our Meteor Mask layer and the Meteor Circle video group. You should see this icon right here, the uh, little arrow pointing down. Left click to apply the mask, and if successful, you should see an arrow next to the mask layer. So the good thing about this is whatever I draw on the mask only shows up on the layers it's applied to. So let's say I wanted to draw a red line here on our circle. It only applies itself to the circle and nothing else. I can also add more masks to the layer that each do their own individual thing. So like, for example, if I wanted this one to have a green line and this one to have an orange one, this is wonderful for video groups as well, because then it works for everything in the video group. As you can see me changing the frames here on our meteor circle. I guess really the only downside is that I don't think you can actually animate a mask here in Photoshop. Um, I actually believe that's more of a video editing thing, so maybe in After Effects. But, however, it's if we're doing it like this, it's really helpful for still images and effects that, that don't move or need much animation. It's outside of changing its own opacity. And whatnot. But anyway, masks also work with layer styles. So. What we're going to do is add a color overlay to this circle. The first thing we're going to do is make sure that the mask layer is at the very beginning of the timeline. Grab the fill bucket and grab a color and left click anywhere on the image. Just make sure that you're on the mask layer before you do this, because I have messed this up many of times. Then go ahead and open up the layer styles menu check mark color overlay and let's get this bluish tint going great now just hit ok and there we go we've applied this mask to all of the frames without applying layer styles individually next thing that we're going to do is add a highlight to this meteor as it turns into materia Let's go ahead and fast forward our timeline all about all the way to where the tail of this meteor disappears. All right, now let's go ahead and start a new video group and call it shine. We'll place it above our color layer, but below our meteor circle layer. Now, because this comes so late in our animation, we can go ahead and split the first frame of this right here. So it starts exactly on this frame. And let me just quickly chop up the shine group so it lines up with the other groups. Then I'm going to chop it up even further. So I'll have more frames to work with before the materia falls. All right, so I'm just gonna take a soft brush with very little opacity and create a small highlight I'm uh, going to grab a lighter hue of this blue and change the blending mode at the top to overlay. After that, just start filling in a shine to the materia and then I'm just going to buffer out the shine so that it fits better. And I'll just keep doing that to the coming frames until the shine goes away and spins around to the back side. The very last thing I'll do is turn the opacity down on the shine group so that it's not too bright. And I'll be able to further adjust the opacity and after effects if need be. And there you go. Gave the materia a little more dimension.
Next, let's add an overall glow to this meteor and materia. Very easy way of doing this. Let's take our meteor circle video group, right click it and duplicate it. Now, don't freak out. The reason why our screen got filled up with this color is because by duplicating the video group, we actually just broke the mask application we had earlier. We'll reapply the mask later. For now, let's just go ahead and hide it by clicking on the eye, uh, this eye next to the layer here. Anyway, our duplicate layer that we made, let's go ahead and name that Glow. Double click it to open the layer style. And this time, let's go to the outer glow and check mark it. Okay, so our blend mode will be normal. Opacity, we'll set it to about 100 for now, just so we can see what we're doing. And keep the noise at zero. Let's select this box right here to the left and pick a color. I'm going to go with a tint that resembles the material. Now that I have the desired color, I can go ahead and start adjusting the size and opacity. And I'll also adjust the range of the glow as well. Hit OK. And there you have it. Have a nice little glow on our material. And now let's go ahead and reapply that circle mask. And turn the visibility back on. Very last couple of things we're going to do are add a sparkle at the beginning before the meteor animation, like uh, this one right here. And then we're going to crop the animation and export as a GIF. So because the sparkle starts at the beginning before the meteor animation, we're going to have to move all of the frames on the timeline forward. Now, while we can shift click almost everything and move it forward manually, um, an even easier and neater way to do this is by scrolling up all the way to the top of your layers, make a new folder group, and let's name it Meteor Animation. And now, let's collapse all of our video groups, select all of them with a shift click, and drag and drop them into that new folder. Go ahead and collapse it and expand it, just to make sure that you got all of the Meteor groups. If you look back at our timeline, everything is gone, except not really because it's um, all right here in this folder. Go ahead and expand it. What's good about this is that now we can move all of our frames by just dragging this folder on the timeline like this. Just make sure that the uh, work area sliders cover all of the frames that you're working on and that you want to see playback of. So now that we've moved our meteor animation forward, we can create a new video group and name it Sparkle. <laughs> That's the best I can come up with. And go ahead and drag it to the beginning of the timeline. Before we start animating, however, we need a reference point of where our meteor is. So let's go back and expand the meteor animation folder, expand meteor circle, and duplicate the very first frame and out of the an meteor animation folder group. Um, as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and drag it to the very top, put it over everything else. We can then collapse all of the other groups after that and move that layer to the very beginning of the timeline. Let's go ahead and set the opacity around maybe 30 to 30 to 40. And let's rename this layer Meteor Ref. Uh, if the opacity is grayed out for you, it's probably because the playhead isn't touching the layer on the timeline. So moving the playhead onto the frame will fix that. Also, make sure to turn off the visibility of the Meteor Animation folder so that we can only see the transparency of our Meteor Ref layer. Let's select our Sparkle video group go to the first frame of that and begin. Okay, so on these layers, I'm just gonna go ahead and use a hard brush with no opacity and draw out a light that flashes off in the uh, distance. I want this to go around my meteor ref here and I want this animation in particular to go in and out quickly. So I'm going to animate this sparkle on maybe just about three to four frames 
uh, for the initial flash and and after that have it be blank for about five frames and then another larger flash that lasts around I'd say a good three frames. I also want the effect to linger just a little bit after the meteor comes out so maybe add an additional two frames onto that. On the last few frames I'll have all of the lines disperse in their opposite direction to help simulate the speed of the incoming meteor. Hit the playback so you can see what you're animating as you are going through just to make sure everything is coming out okay. Um, especially in this case because it, it's important to see how the meteor animation follows after the uh, sparkle there. So I'm going to turn the visibility back on for the meteor animation group and I'm also going to extend my work area. For the second flash, I'll select all the frames there and enlarge it to give it a little bit more impact as the meteor appears. Yeah, and there we go. Awesome. We now have ourselves a shooting star. We can now go ahead and delete in the uh, meteor reference layer. And finally, let's go ahead and crop out the exterior and export it as a GIF. So let's go ahead and unlock our 1920 by 1080 cam and background layers. Then we are going to set the visibility to solo our 1920 by 1080 layer, um, having all of the other layers invisible. So anyway, to do that, hold the Alt key on your keyboard and left click the eye icon next to the layer. Next, we are going to grab our magic wand tool and left click the gray rectangle in the middle of our screen. Uh, now that the rectangle is selected, let's grab our crop tool. Once selected, you should see this grid right here. Next, all you have to do is just push enter and everything outside the cam rectangle should have gone away. And to bring everything back, go ahead and alt click the eye icon on that 1920 by 1080 cam layer and all the layers will once again be visible. Okay, and the very last thing to do is just export as a GIF. So to do this, let's go ahead and go to file, export, and save for web legacy. And once you do that, the uh, save for web window should pop up. Let's not worry about the preset for now. It, uh, it's going to change on its own as we go along. So going down the list, make sure that GIF is selected. Then Adaptive. And then Diffusion. We can go ahead and uncheck Transparency since it's really just going to be a standard GIF with a uh, black background. And on the right side, change these colors to 256 and right below that set this to 100%. Now let's come down to the image size. Uh, let's say you wanted to upload your animation to a site like Giphy. is either 720 or 480p for GIFs. So let's go with 480 and that should be around 640 for the width and 480 for the height. And right below that, change the looping options to forever so that your GIF loops over and over. Before we save, let's just make sure everything looks good in the preview. After that, just hit save and export it to any location that you desire. All right, go ahead and pat yourself on the back. The meteor animation is done. I just wanted to say that Photoshop usually takes away from the quality of the animation if we save it as a web legacy. In future tutorials, we'll be getting into higher quality stuff like rendering this to a QuickTime format with alpha channels so we can add them into other pieces of animation in Adobe After Effects and Adobe Premiere.